Imagine, you are sitting in the passenger seat of a large airliner. Outside the window is the sky at an altitude of 12 kilometers. Everything is calm. You have just taken off. There are several hours of flight ahead. The pilots are communicating on the radio. The flight attendants are serving drinks. No one can even imagine that in a few minutes the plane will lose both engines. Completely, without noise, without warning, in absolute silence, it will begin to fall but not rapidly, it will glide, like a giant metal bird without wings. And at that moment, everything will depend on the two people in the cockpit, on their composure, experience, and a little luck. This is not science fiction. This is not a scene from a movie. This is a real story that happened on July 23rd, 1983. A story that forever changed the standards in aviation. A story that is now called the miracle in Gimli. Or, to put it simply, Gimli Glider. Morning of July 23rd, Montreal International Airport. Air Canada Boeing 767 is preparing to take off for Edmonton with a stopover in Ottawa. This is one of the company's newest aircraft, modern, safe, fuel efficient. It is equipped with an electronic fuel control system, which recently replaced the usual analog gauges. In the cockpit is Captain Rob Pearson. He has thousands of hours of flight time behind him. Experienced, calm, reasonable. Next to him is second pilot Maurice Quintal. Also not a newbie. The crew is well coordinated and the flight promises to be easy. However, the first odd thing happened in the morning. The electronic fuel control system does not work. The indicators are empty. The refuelers cannot determine exactly how much fuel is in the tanks. They have to calculate the amount manually. And here is the key mistake. At that time, Canada was switching from the British to the metric system of measures. Instead of kilograms as expected, refuelers and pilots calculate the amount of fuel in pounds. It turns out that the plane gets about half as much fuel as it needs. Instead of 20 tons, it gets about 10. Nobody notices, everything seems normal. And Flight 143 takes off from Montreal to Ottawa and then continues west to Edmonton. There are 61 passengers and eight crew members on board. At 1745, about halfway through the flight, at an altitude of 12,500 meters, the first strange event occurs. One of the engines switches off. The captain decides to descend and contact the nearest airport. But just a few minutes later, the second engine switches off. Total thrust failure. The Boeing 767, weighing about 100 tons, loses all power. The plane, equipped with two turbofan engines, becomes a giant glider. There is alarm in the cockpit. The electrical system switches off. The light on the panel flickers. Radio communication is unstable. And in the cabin, there is silence. An unusual, frightening silence. The passengers do not yet fully understand what is happening, but the crew already knows. They have no more than 20 minutes to find a place to land. Despite the emergency, the crew maintains complete composure, and it saves lives. Captain Rob Pearson used to be a keen glider, and these skills, which seem like a hobby, suddenly become crucial. He knows how to fly a plane without engines, how to control the descent, how to manage the airflow. Co-pilot Maurice Quintal quickly calculates the distance to the nearest airport. That would be Winnipeg, but it's too far. There is no more fuel. Then he remembers an abandoned military airbase in the small town of Gimli, a former Royal Canadian Air Force airfield. The runway is short, but it might do. There is just one problem. The runway is no longer used for aviation. That day, there are car races going on there. People, children, trailers are parked right on the runway, and no one knows that a faulty plane is flying towards them. With a complete loss of power, the plane loses most of its control. No automation, no hydraulics, no normal communications. But the 767 has a backup system called the RAT, or Ram Air Turbine. It's a small propeller that extends out from the body and is turned by the airflow. It supplies minimal electricity and pressure to the hydraulic system so that the pilots can at least somehow control the plane. There's another complication. The landing gear does not release automatically. 
It has to be released manually using old-fashioned mechanics, literally by turning knobs and pulling levers. One of the landing gears does not lock completely and remains free-floating. This adds risk to landing. The plane is too high and flying too fast. To reduce speed, the captain uses a method called S-turns. He makes a series of sharp turns left and right, reducing altitude and removing excess speed. This maneuver is considered risky even for a working plane. And here, without an engine, almost no control. But there is no choice. This is the last chance. The crew sees the runway. It is already close, but there are people on it. Tents, trailers, and barriers are set up right on the runway. From the ground, it seems that the plane is descending too quickly. People are running away in panic, and the pilots understand that the landing will be hard. At 18.45, 17 minutes after both engines completely stopped, the Boeing 767 touches the ground. The left chassis, not fully locked, breaks. The plane slides along the runway, right sparking on the metal. There are almost no brakes. Control is minimal, but it slows down and stops just a few meters from the crowd. No one on board died. At most, a few minor bruises on passengers. The plane itself is damaged, but not critically. It will be repaired later and will fly again. When everything calmed down, an investigation began. The cause of the incident turned out to be almost anecdotal. A failure during the transition from the Imperial to the metric system of measurements. The fuelers were using pounds, not kilograms, and the fuel monitoring system display was faulty. But no one recalculated manually. No one double-checked. After this incident, the aviation industry tightened controls over the conversion of units, introduced double checks and standardized refueling procedures, and the Boeing 767 received a reputation as a reliable machine capable of withstanding the almost impossible. Pearson and Quintal became heroes, although at first they even tried to punish them. Later they were acquitted, and the story entered all aviation safety textbooks. Today, the plane known as the Gimli Glider is in a museum, and its story lives on as a legend. It is a reminder that even in the most critical moments when technology fails, the human mind, experience, and calm can do the impossible. If you like the story, like it, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell. And if you want to hear other incredible stories from the world of aviation, write in the comments.